Okay, class. Okay, I'll take care of that. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me know. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my absolute pleasure to uh, invite our guest speaker today. She is my old friend and an old colleague in the University of Cambridge. We did our master's together, but she stayed in Cambridge and she got her PhD uh, after everybody else left. Um, mostly, right? Because Uvin was yeah. there as well. So um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Judith, she completed her PhD at the University of Cambridge, considering the optimization of the process of planning and developing large infrastructure projects, including the economic, social, environmental, and institutional effects of delays in project development. She's currently working on the Future Dams Research Project, which will explore how global capital flows can influence the emergence of more sustainable hydropower infrastructure. For the majority of her career, uh, Judith has worked on large infrastructure and engineering projects in developing countries with the aim of bringing sustainable improvements in living standards and reductions in poverty. Judith's principal area of expertise is in the structuring, financing, and economic development of infrastructure utilities and projects. She was jointly responsible for developing and implementing a strategy for re-engagement of the World Bank in the construction of large water infrastructure. So today, um, she'll be talking about developing, developing sustainably or sustainable development. So please join me to welcoming um, uh, Judith, it's it's our pleasure. The floor, the virtual floor is all yours. Please go ahead. Thanks very much indeed, Mawa, and um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, developing sustainably or sustainable development, um, I would would so love to just to spend the next half hour debating this question with you, because I I really like to ask. Um, groups of people what they think the difference is. Um, but sadly, the, the um, online format makes debate a little bit more difficult. So the difference to me is in um, developing sustainably has the emphasis on actually developing, whereas sustainable development restricts development to that which is sustainable. And um, while sustainable development is a very laudable aim, if developing countries are restricted, particularly if you look at but one metric, so if you focus on something like carbon, many developing countries are currently on the lowest carbon trajectory they will ever be on. Any form of development that they take beyond where they are now will actually lead to an increase in their carbon emissions. So um, it's, it's a difficult call sometimes as to whether we focus on development or focus on ensuring it's sustainable. And we would like to think those two things are not incompatible, but just sometimes they are. Uh, this is a quote from Nelson Mandela, and I put it out to remind ourselves that infrastructure development is not about infrastructure. Very few countries actually set out um, to build a dam or to build a road or to lay so many miles of concrete. They don't set out to do that. What they want is the outcome. They want the, the lights, the running water, um, the as as uh, Nelson Mandela says here, the power which that gives to the people that they provide the services to. So uh, never mistake the need for infrastructure with the need for infrastructure services. So what I'm really going to talk about today is the fact that every infrastructure project creates social environmental opportunities as well as difficulties. We have a responsibility to maximize those opportunities, to make sure that you get as much benefit out of an infrastructure project as you possibly can. 
And I think as time goes by, we're learning that um, reducing the negative impacts of infrastructure is something we've learned to do. But taking advantage of the positive um, externalities associated with infrastructure is something we're less good at. I'm going to talk to you using an example of a hydropower project in the north of India called Rampur, which was the last one that I worked on before I left the World Bank. And you can see from this map, it just gives you an idea where it is. It's in the northern parts of India in a state called Himachal Pradesh. And it's on the, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Now, this particular project was interesting because it didn't actually need a dam. The project took water from an upstream project, which had a dam, and there was sufficient natural head between the two projects that if you put the water through a tunnel, you could generate another 400 megawatts without needing another dam. So a fascinating project. And um, what I'd like to tell you a bit about today is some of the local development activities which went alongside this project and the ways in which they maximized the local benefits which accrued to the surrounding villages rather than the electricity which tended to accrue to the big cities. So one of the first things they did was to set aside 1% of project revenues for local families as an annuity for the 30 years of the project concession. So as long as the developer had to develop this project before it was returned to the government, they would pay out 1% of revenues to local families. And this was really interesting because one of the problems that we had with resettlement was something we referred to as an intergenerational problem. You would pay compensation to a particular group of people. And sometimes what we'd find is that a few years later, um, a young man would turn up at the project gates and say, well, what about me? And the answer would be, well, your father was compensated for the land that you lost. And he'd say, well, yes, but he spent that money. And now I don't have the land and I don't have the compensation. So what about me? And so providing this annuity to the local families meant that they continued to have an engagement with the project and they continued to feel as though they were benefiting from giving, giving their room to this project. Money was also set aside for local development projects. And that was partly because um, the, uh, the villages which weren't affected but which were close, um, often felt really uh, sort of disgruntled that they didn't get compensated. So they didn't lose any land, um, they didn't lose their houses, uh, they were maybe affected a little bit by the construction traffic, but basically they were not greatly affected by the project. But they still felt um, that they ought to get something because they were next door to the people who were affected. And this is difficult because, you know, you could go on making that argument for, for miles away from the project. But um, what this project did was to set up a local development fund and it said that um, villages could bid for money from the local development fund to do small projects within their village, maybe to build a, um, a community hall or to pave the road um, to their village, something which would enhance their living standards. The other thing, and this is a picture of the houses which were built for the people who had to move because their homes were going to be impacted by the project, of which there were only about 20 families. Um, these were the houses that were built. Uh, the families were allowed to build their own houses. They were given the money, given the resources, provided with additional assistance, and they could build the house however they wanted. And I think that was a real 
real bonus of this particular project and could be done because the numbers were small. Normally you get row upon row of identical houses built and given to the people who are relocated. Here they built their own. But I want to zoom in on this house here. Because the blue, the bottom level of house that you can see there, is the house that was built for the, um, with their resettlement money. But um, what they've done since then is they've started, as you can see, to add a top floor to the house. And um, this was the sort of thing that the people who were relocated did. Um, it really gave them an opportunity to develop their um, house considerably because they had a what the Indians would call a pucker house, a house which had strong foundations, which meant it was strong enough to manage an upper floor. Um, the project uh, commissioned some mobile health vans and sent round to all the local communities. But interestingly, they did this from... Uh, two years before they started construction. So this was real hearts and minds stuff. This was about building a, a level of trust with the local communities and the project developers saying, we are sufficiently invested in this area that we're prepared to spend money even before we've actually been allocated the project. And the local people really liked this because they might have to walk quite a long way to reach a doctor or a clinic. And this van goes round to each village. I think there are 14 villages. They get visited once a fortnight for a morning or an afternoon. And the project provides for the medicines and the government provides um, the doctor and the project provides the health van. And the people really appreciated that benefit. And when it came to negotiating with them, the fact that they'd already had this had really built up a good relationship with the project authorities. Um, any contract which was below um, a million rupees, about $18,000, had to be offered first to any member of the affected community who might be able to perform that contract. So this really made sure that the little contracts to do with the project all went to local communities. One of the biggest of that was um, the, the project hired vehicles from the local community. And a lot of um, local people bought a car, uh, usually with a loan, which they then hired out to the project. They managed to recover enough money through hiring their vehicle to the project to pay for the pay off the loan, and when the project was complete, they had a vehicle which they didn't have beforehand. Then that made a big difference for a lot of people. Uh, there was a big emphasis on education and um, sponsoring teenagers to go to technical college, apprenticeships, merit scholarships, everything that they could do to try to. Um, educate people to uh, build up the skills necessary that they could perhaps go to work for one of the contractors or that they could start their own business. And this is a picture of women being taught to use sewing machines so that they can have their own sewing or repair business. And um, this helped particularly with the female headed households um, because uh, there are many households where perhaps the husband has died or left and you end up with a widower or a divorced woman looking after children. Now, many of the opportunities that go with a big contract go to able-bodied men. And so providing a way in which uh, teenagers or women could benefit from the project was very important. And one of the things I really like about this project is that we, we actually contracted the local university to do a study before the project, during the project and after the project as to how the local people were affected. And so this is the, um, some of the results they had after the project. And one of your things you'll notice is that 
uh, the female uh, participants were generally less able to take advantage of some of the opportunities than the male participants, except the one I've highlighted there, which is people who were availed themselves of the mobile health band facilities. And that was more, actually more women managed to use the mobile health bands than men, which uh, is terrific because it can be very difficult to manage to get any development to the women. Uh, so that was good, but you'll see also there were things like veterinary and horticulture camps, which would teach people how to look after livestock or how to grow plants. A lot of things which were, were useful in helping them in income generation. So ultimately, average incomes in the area around the project increased by 50%. Female literacy, look at this, increased from 7 to 83%. And houses which had a separate toilet increased to 91%. The average number of rooms that in a house increased from 3.7 to 6.9 per house. And if you think about that picture of the house I showed you, you can see how that might happen. Uh, this picture is actually of what they refer to as the bus stand. And um, we, I've, I don't know how that plays in American English, but in, um, in Britain, the bus stand is actually just the bus stop, the place where you might board a bus on the side of the road. So when they said they were going to build a bus stand, I was expecting something very small. This is what in England we'd probably call a bus station. And they built a whole bus station for the local town, which helped in transport. The other thing they worked really hard on was in transparency. And um, they did this to try to reduce corruption. And this is a big issue with any infrastructure project I've ever been involved in. There are difficulties with corruption. And um, what was done on this project was to make everything transparent. Everything was published. And this may be difficult for um, those of us who live in societies who value their privacy. Um, but in this case, everybody who benefited from the project everybody who got a contract, everything was made public. And that made it a lot more difficult for people to find corrupt ways around the system because everybody could check what everyone else was getting and whether they were getting the same or different as somebody else. So um, what can I summarize from that project? Um, first of all, it's a different skill set from building the infrastructure project itself. I haven't really talked to you at all about the actual hydropower project, which was underneath this. Um, and, but you do need people with a totally different skill set, even a different mindset, because many of the engineers who I work with on these projects tend to have a mindset of wanting to reassure the local people that um, what they're doing is going to be safe and all right. And um, reassurance isn't always what it's about. Although people do want to be reassured, they also want to understand. And there's a tendency perhaps just to tell them, don't worry, don't worry, we've got it covered, but that's not enough. The other thing is that whatever you do in terms of trying to help the local people around an infrastructure project, will never be enough. There will always be one more person or one more village or one more area or one more project you could have done. And it's very difficult to know when to draw the line. I've talked a little bit about the intergenerational difficulties and the importance of making sure that the benefits of a project last for more than one generation and move on in time. And the important difference between empowering people and making them dependent on a particular project. And um, I once worked on a project where they were, um, it was a, for a thermal power station many, many years ago, and it required uh, some 
cooling water. And as a result, actually warmed the water in the bay beside the project. As a result, it made it the perfect place to start farming prawns. This was in Southern India. And um, we came up with a theory that perhaps the local people could get together to have some sort of cooperative for farming prawns and selling them. And this was something they could make a significant amount of money from. So we um, got in a prawns expert and uh, he worked out what they'd need and the project promised to set them up with all the equipment they'd need, seed prawns, which I didn't know were a thing, but apparently they are. Um, and we had a, a long meeting and explained all of this to the local people and what a great opportunity this was. And they sat and they asked really interested questions. And um, when they got to the end of the meeting, the kind of leader of the association stood up and he said, you know, I think this is a brilliant idea. You've, uh, thank you so much for working all this out for us. Uh, that there's only one small change I would make. So we said, what's that? And he said, well, he said, I think it would be better if the power company ran the prawn farm and gave us jobs working for the power company. <laughs> because actually what they wanted was a firm job. They were not all closet entrepreneurs. They didn't desperately want to work for themselves. They wanted to work for the power company, which was seen as a sort of job for life. So, yeah. Uh, a small comment on scale. This project I've just been talking to you about was a project which was big enough to have the resources, affected a relatively small number of people, and as a result could develop a really bespoke um, uh, local infrastructure development project. If a project is smaller than this, it may not have the resources or the skills to invest in this kind of community development. And if it's very large, and this is a picture of three gorges in China, which relocated 1.3 million people, if it's very large, it's difficult to have anything which is feels individual or bespoke for the, the people concerned. So uh, it's, it's a difficult balance to get right. Um, just looking at one or two other projects around the world, this is Rogun, which is in Tajikistan. And I raise this because um, for a long time, the people of Uzbekistan were desperately opposed to this project. And the people surrounding it were actually not that opposed to it. Um, the concern was that it was felt it would change the water flows in Uzbekistan and would consequently affect their irrigation. And at one point, the um, leaders of Uzbekistan threatened to invade Tajikistan if they built this project. Uh, this is a later prime minister of Uzbekistan who, when he came in, decided to reach agreement and they reached some agreements and managed to allow the development of this project. But um, regional or cross-border concerns between a region, a state, even a, a parish, um, can be a problem and it's very important to make sure that what we refer to as the upstream and downstream riparians of a project are all happy with it. <laughs> 